Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. Yeah, um, a struggle I've had during the pandemic is I'm definitely a control person. I like to know what's going on, what's coming next. So it's really pushed me during this time to be to have my hands open and just ready for whatever God has and leaning less on what I'm hearing in the news and less of what I think should be happening and more of what um, more of what God's plan could be and just trusting that He is good. Um, I've found hope in the pandemic by going to God's word, um, especially the passages that talk about how he is in control, that he's constant, and that he's good. Um, I think in this period of uncertainty, it's been really good to go back and be reminded that uh, God and his promises never change. One way I've seen God working through our students this year is that um, through the pandemic, they've seen some of the isolation that's been going on and they've desired to partner with the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, recognizing that um, that might be more prevalent coming out of the pandemic. And they have um, been leading a charge to do fundraising and be um, raising awareness and desiring to partner with our community in that way. So it's been fun to work with them and to hear their ideas and passion to serve the community of West Fargo and Fargo-Moorhead, West Fargo as a whole. A scripture reading today comes from Psalm chapter 46. And in light of Reformation Week and Reformation Sunday, uh, it'd be good for us to know that this is one of the Psalms that Martin Luther used to write, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. God is our refuge and strength in ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we continue in worship.
Never blow. 
from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the love of Christ, I'll stand. Thank you for joining us. As we open up God's word today, we're in our series in 1 Peter, Encouragement for the Scattered. And we're going to take a look at a passage that begins in Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. And before we go there, I have a question. I wonder, are you, I know I have been in this situation, have you ever been in the situation where you get a message, or maybe it's a piece of mail, that wasn't intended for you. You get somebody else's message or somebody else's letter. I know for me that's happened. Uh, in fact, there's a couple of indications or a couple of examples. First of all, my wife and I just recently moved to a new location, a new address, and we are continually getting mail in our box that's for somebody else. It's got their name on it, even though it's got our address. It's clearly somebody else's mail. And I, I wonder, what are they missing? You know, it's, some of them are, seem important letters, letters from banks and letters from car dealerships. I, I don't know. Maybe they're just promotional things and it doesn't matter. But I don't know what to do when I get somebody else's mail. I really don't have any choice. I sort through them throw it back in the box, put the flag up, and I make the mail carrier. <laughs> Frankly, I make, I make that person deal with it. And, and they don't come back usually, so they must deal with it fine. There's another time in my life when I've had this happen. And this one too, maybe you can relate to. Uh, I got one of the first cell phones I got. This would be over 15 years ago. I, I got a cell phone and I kept getting phone calls for Dave. Dave must have had a number that was either close to mine or perhaps the number was inadvertently published wrong somewhere. I don't know. But Dave was obviously a contractor. And I'd get phone calls. I'd pick it up and they'd say, uh, hi, is Dave there? Nope. There's no Dave at this number. I think you have the wrong number. Typically, they were really polite and, and apologized and hung up. But there were times they'd leave messages on my phone, and it was messages about building materials, typically. At the time, I was teaching, so I'd go three, four hours sometimes when I wouldn't check my phone. And I came back to my office one day. It was the middle of the afternoon. I saw I had a message on my phone. So I thought, well, I wonder what this is. I pulled up the message, and the message, in essence, said, hey, Dave, this is, I don't remember the guy's name, this is Fred. And I just wanted you to know, I know you're expecting concrete at 10 a.m. this morning, but we're having trouble at the cement plant. We aren't going to be able to get concrete out to you till 2 o'clock this afternoon. I hope you and your crew can find other ways to use your time. I don't want you to just sit and wait for us. I looked at my watch. It was a quarter to three. I wondered, how long do you suppose Dave and his crew have been sitting there going, I don't know, they should have been here by now. It, it causes confusion. It causes all kinds of problems. When we get other people's messages or when other people get ours. In, in the word today, in 1 Peter, we're going to see him give messages to different groups of people. And it's worth our time to think a little bit about who he's writing or who he's addressing these messages to. Let's read the scripture. If you are with me, you can turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. 
Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you would silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? This is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. It's from Isaiah 53. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseers of your souls. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyle and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight." For this is the way holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Father God, as we explore these words that you've given us in 1 Peter, would you use them by the power of your Holy Spirit to shape us more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. So the message here in 1 Peter really are a series of messages about how to behave. It's about how to live. And and if we aren't careful, if we don't carefully think about who is this written to, we could easily misunderstand the purpose of these words. So if if we're going to look at uh, who is this written to, who's Whose mail is this? Who who is this addressed to? We don't have to go very far. If we just go one verse before the passage that we read, it's it's in chapter 2, verse 10, and it's a part of the, the text that was preached on last week. And it simply says, once you were not a people but now you are the people of God. Once you did not know mercy, but now you have received mercy. This letter, this this series of statements about how to behave or encouragement about behavior, this comes to people who have already received the mercy and the grace of God, who have already received the free gift, have already received by faith the mercy of God 
that forgives their sins. These are people who are trusting Jesus. So it would be inappropriate for us to think about these words as words that help us know how do we earn the mercy of God. It's not a formula. It is written to those who already are trusting in Christ and are asking the question, so how do I live? How do I live out as a person who has received mercy? How do I live that out in the community? And Peter, as a partial answer to that prayer, there are four groups that he addresses. He addresses citizens, he addresses slaves, and he addresses wives and husbands. And as I take a look at each of these four groups of people, I, I want to focus on, on two principles. The first principle is this. Read your own mail. Read your own mail. Let me help walk through that as we look at each of these four groups of people. First of all, to citizens. He kind of speaks to all of the people who are hearing this letter as Roman citizens. And, and he really has three things that he tells them. First of all, he tells them to live good lives before your neighbors. Be a, be a good community member. Be the person who, at some point in time, when your neighbors and your friends and the people across the street and the people who know you, the people in your community, at some point in time, when they meet the Lord, whether that's in some, in some meeting here on earth or whether it's on the day of glory when they have to face judgment, when they meet God, they'll go, oh, I get it. That's what God does in the lives of people who receive his mercy. Not only be good citizens, but then he goes on and says to obey or submit or respect those who are in authority. Whether it's the emperor or governors. <laughs> I could go on about that. I won't. Except to say this. Peter's indication is if you have received mercy, his, his statement to us is if you have received mercy, then recognize that those people are in place fulfilling a purpose and doing a job. And people of faith should treat them with honor and respect. In fact, he goes so far as to say, honor the emperor. Honor, if, you, if any of you have looked into to Roman history, this statement, honor the emperor, is, that's an amazing statement to make. Uh, Rome doesn't necessarily have a track record at this point of emperors that have a lot of time for Christians. In fact, if Bible scholars and historians are accurate, Probably Peter wrote this during the time of the emperor Nero. Nero was quite a guy. Nero came to power as a teenager, mostly because he had a conniving mother who uh, swindled and murdered her way into influence to make sure that Nero took the throne. Maybe at about age 16, Nero, within about five or six years of taking over the throne, had his own mother murdered because now she was in his way. Nero, by almost every indication, was nuts. This is, this is the emperor that Peter says, honor the emperor. Nero had this reputation of being a, 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 a rich, kind of spoiled kid. 
he fancied himself a musician and an actor, and he'd put himself on stage and force people to come and watch him. He had a reputation of not really caring about people around him or, or generally caring about Roman culture or even, even the Roman Empire as a whole. In 64 AD, when Rome burned, people started a rumor at least most historians believe it to be only rumor, that Nero started the fire, in part just to watch it burn. Significant that people of the day believed the rumor. That's the kind of person Emperor Nero was. He was the kind of person that when somebody said, I'll bet he started the fire that burned Rome down, everybody went, yeah, I probably did. That's the guy that Peter says, honor the emperor? The emperor is nuts. But we have to be a little bit careful because Peter says, honor him anyway. Second group of people that, that Peter lays this plan out, what do we do now? Are, he uses the word slave. And he says, slaves, submit to your masters. Now, it's worth talking a little bit about slavery. People in history have used this passage, especially in American history, have used this passage to say that slavery is okay. That's not what Peter's saying here. Peter is merely recognizing that there's a large number of people in the Christian church at the time who would be reading this letter who would find themselves in the position of a slave. Slaves were not a racial category of people like, they, like we think of them in American history. Slaves would fit into a few categories. Perhaps they were captured in war and made to be slaves. Uh, they might be debtors, couldn't pay their debts, and so they became a slave. It might be somebody who was what we would call a bond servant. A bond servant was somebody who said, you know what, I'd like to work for you. If I work for you, will you take care of whatever I need? They would fit into this category that Peter's addressing when he addresses slaves. Probably would include even household servants. So I don't think it's a stretch to say what he addresses here to slaves actually can also be understood to refer to employees or workers. Slaves and masters, I think it's appropriate for us to also apply this to workers and their bosses. Slaves, obey your masters. Even the evil ones, um, one of the ways this has been a problem, and it gets back to this idea of reading your own mail, is that we have bosses and masters who are looking to their slaves saying, you have to submit to me. That's evidence that masters are reading somebody else's mail. Most of the information about slavery that most of the misuse of this passage in the U.S. about slavery has to do with masters who are not slaves reading slaves' mail and saying, this is what you should do. Now, there's a, there's a message here to slaves. There's a message here to citizens. And we need to understand what applies to us and not overstep when it's somebody else's mail. Perhaps there's nowhere where that's more true than in the area of wives and husbands. There's some tough stuff. There's, Peter addresses wives here. And there's some stuff that in modern Western culture is, is kind of tough to swallow. And the biggest danger is that husbands would come and say, here, wife, this is what you should be. And it's evidence that a husband's reading somebody else's mail. Because husbands, you have mail. And you know what it says? It says to be considerate 
of your wives. Husbands, some translation use the word understanding. Understand your wife. Tons of jokes, right? Women, who can understand them? Tons of jokes about, I don't get my wife. Well, according to Peter, not getting it, not understanding, is not really an option. In fact, it's just the opposite. I've heard it said this way, a husband should study his wife so that he does know, so that he can understand. It's much, much easier to throw up our hands and say, I don't get it. But if we have received mercy, Peter says, understand, be considerate. There's a second principle here. Read your own mail, but a second principle is, is something that all of these messages, all four of these messages have in common. And it's this. Peter in these passages calls all of us to die to ourself. It's almost an echo of what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, where he says that you should be, you should give yourself as a living sacrifice. See, dying to self means that when, when I'm face to face with, with a civic leader, with an emperor or a governor or a you fill in the blank, when I'm face to face with them and they're telling me something I don't want to do, my call is to die to myself. When I find myself as a worker, face to face with something my boss has asked me to do, and I think, I don't want to do that. That's ridiculous. The call from Peter is to die to myself. Husbands, wives, the call here is to die to self. Because you see, it's primarily our self that gets in the way of living life the way God calls us to live it as people who have received mercy, as people who are a part of the family of faith and the family of God. And just in case we wonder if it's worth it, just in case, or maybe we need an example of what it looks like to die to self, Peter includes that. Peter includes that in this writing in verses 21 through 24. And it says this, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Hear that phrase, you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at them, he did not retaliate. And when he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He, Jesus, himself, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds, you have been healed. That's dying to self. And it's why we're called to do the same. Jesus not only died to himself in that he died for what he, in his humanness on earth, would have preferred, but he literally died. His body crucified on the cross is what purchases our forgiveness. It's what allows us to receive God's mercy and be reconciled to him. And not only is he the one that purchased it, but by his power, we are given the ability and the opportunity for us to die 
to ourselves. And as it says, and become God's slaves. Oh, by God's grace, may he give us the opportunity to die to self and live as God's slaves. Let's pray. Father God, these words are hard for us sometimes. We need your grace and mercy for those times when we fail. And we need your power and strength to recognize and live out the transforming work of your gospel in our lives. Would you graciously give us the ability to do that? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so glad that you joined us online today, and we hope that you have encountered the grace and truth of Jesus Christ during our time together. If you've been blessed by our service and the ministry here, we'd love for you to partner with us in some practical ways that make this online mission possible. You can share this service with your family and friends, you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube, or if you feel so led, you can support us financially. Simply go to triumphlbc.org and follow the instructions there. And we'd love to hear from you in other ways as well. Before we go, would you receive this blessing on your week? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn to you with favor, give you his grace and peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to serve the Lord.